that's okay. I'm Andy. Cloud. Did a boy give you that? No. My mom said if I ever got into trouble, I could hock it and come home. So why didn't you come to Berlin? You know those life experiences that people talk about all the time? I don't want this to end. I wish I could stay. I was actually gonna go. Andy, what is going on? You said you want to see? Open the door! No one can hear you. The character is constantly moving. He feels shame about himself. You don't have to do this. We are a team. There's nowhere for me to go. <laughs> How do you think this is going? Us? Lisa, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on the film. It's an incredible performance. A completely oh. different kind of movie than I think. Well, actually, I mean, you've done horror before, and I think people would go into this expecting a sort of horror movie, but this yeah. is actually a much deeper, darker story than you normally get. Yeah, so talk about how you got involved with this. Um, I was sent the script uh, at the beginning of 2015, and I read it. And I was terrified. It was so harrowing and gritty and raw. And, um, but I thought it was so much more than the typical captor, captive story. I thought it just went deeper. And then I saw that Kate Shortland was directing. I'm a huge fan of hers. And then I auditioned. I did like a four-hour audition for four it. Four-hour audition. Being traumatised in the audition, yes. Is that what it is? Is it? I mean, because there are so many layers that you have to do as an actress in this part. More, so, as we said, more so than you would normally see in a captor, captive movie. And in a four-hour four-hour audition, is that about seeing sort of all of those different layers and how you, as an actress, sort of interpret and analyze the text? Yeah, actually, a lot of it was just conversation, just getting to know each other. The director asked me a bunch of questions about myself. What would you do in a situation? Yeah, yeah. How would you escape? Um, and we just had this great camaraderie and it was a, a wonderful collaborative effort. And I actually wish all auditions were like that because you usually get five minutes to go in a room and prove that you're the best for the part. And I never think it's the best way to do it. Um, but this was great because we really tried everything. And then I found out a few months later that I got it. So you find out that you get this part and then you guys go into shooting. How did you develop a relationship with your co-star? It's really a two-hander, this film. It is, yeah. Um, it was really important that we got to know each other well and so we had this uh, three-week rehearsal and it was so interesting because she brought our director brought in this um, body language expert and she came in to work with us so we would get familiar in each other's space intimately because we have some sex scenes and we have to be in each other's orbit. In different so, kinds of sex scenes, <clears throat> you know, like they, yeah. they run the gamut in terms of what is supposed to be going on mentally the, with these yes, characters. the emotional. Because we delve into this idea of Stockholm Syndrome as well, which is really fascinating and, you know, something I didn't know that much about. But um, this woman came in and she had us do activities where we'd be blindfolded and we had to get in sync with each other's breathing, but we weren't allowed to say anything. And he'd be on one side of the room, I'd be on the other. So you'd really have to tune into each other's energy. Um, we did other things where... He would have like peppermint 
on his body somewhere and I'd have to try and find the peppermint with my eyes closed. <laughs> so we got used to being in, in each other's space and I remember at the time we were both mortified. We're like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. But is that about, is doing that about stripping away yes. the, the mortification and, and the embarrassment of doing Yeah, the, the self-consciousness that you get when you're around someone you don't know very well but you have to have this insane connection for this film um it was great it's about breaking you down it's, it's about breaking you down making, making sure you've <laughs> humiliated yourself as much as possible in front of this yeah. person before having to do it in front That's of a camera right. crew and you get all the giggles out of the way in the rehearsal period and then you can just be in flow with each other and then you're fine what what else was the rehearsal period like because three weeks of rehearsal is a luxury when it comes to movies of this yeah. of this size these days of really of any kind of movie, movie I think. <clears throat> yeah uh, we just broke down the script I think scene by scene we went through and so talked necessary about it for a project like this yeah it is because I think you can come into a film like this and just try and wing it and try and play these characters but she wanted to Kate Shortland the director wanted to get behind the psychology of it all so we played around so much. We, she basically gave us a playground and she said, now you guys can play on this playground. Do whatever you want to do. Try the craziest stuff That's you've never been able rehearsal? to do. Yeah, 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 just metaphor. Um, no, but no, I got it. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, in the re rehearsal. She was like, okay, this is kind of the parameters. You guys can go for it and I want you to go for it. Let's try bizarre things that might not work at all but at least we know where we're gonna land on the day. So we got all that work out of the way and I've never done that before in a film. Usually you come and you get 20 minutes of rehearsal before you actually shoot the scene, but this way we came in, we knew the scenes back to front, we were comfortable with each other and then we could just go and be real and breathe and be present. And, and now it. when you get to the shoot and you are breathing and present in the, in the shoot, are you taking basically some of that gonzo stuff that you did during the rehearsal and she has, sort of found out what worked in the rehearsal and now directing you towards that when you're shooting live? Or are you yeah. going into the process shooting in front of cameras differently? Um, actually, kind of the same. We're still playing around on the day. And she's like, oh, do you remember that amazing thing that you guys did? Like, let's try that this time. And why don't we do that other thing that we thought didn't work, but we may as well just put it in front of the camera and see what it does. So it was actually quite interesting for me this time seeing it as a fully realised film because I had no idea what she did in the edit, which version she took. So instead of just doing a scene one way and slightly altering it, we were doing it lots of different ways. So it was, yeah, it was just a whole different process. How, how long was the shoot for the, for the film itself? Um, we did three weeks in Berlin where we did all the exteriors. Then we had a three-week hiatus and I actually flew down to Australia and I did some of Hacksaw Ridge, um, which was bizarre to move from this girl into, like, Dorothy Doss, this, like, woman of faith. And yeah, I also would movie. imagine moving from this production to that production so like Mel as well. Gibson's. Yeah, yeah, I know. It was it would totally messed with my head. But then I had to go back to this and... And, um, and that was another three weeks. So it was a total of six also, weeks. No offence to Mel Gibson, but being directed by a feminine energy versus being directed by, by Mel, Mel Gibson. The whole, the whole thing was a big contrast. I was like, well, okay, cool. I'm just going to go along with the ride. <laughs> So then you had a few weeks to shoot the interiors, which is, I would imagine, the most, the, you know, a lot yeah. of the most difficult stuff to shoot. And when you get there, do you feel totally prepared to hit the tones and the notes that you need to hit based off the rehearsals? You, well, what she wanted us to do was be prepared, but then be so ready to be open and in the moment and do different things. So it's, you have a level of preparation. You know your work and you know your character so incredibly well that you can just tap into any sort of area, any zone, any flavor that she's looking for. That's really brave on the part of a director and the actors considering the sort of tightrope in tone this, this, this film has to walk. You know, I, I would imagine most directors would go into it and be like, no, this is the moment where you're rethinking why you're scared and this, and I need yeah. you to do that right now because that's what, I'm that's what I'm confident in working. Yeah, well, that's why I loved working with Kate is because she completely trusted us as actors. She chose us. We did the rehearsal period. So she knew what we could do. And then she was like, use your instincts. Like, go up, lean into your intuition. What was that like for you as an actress? We were talking about this before. How often do you find in the roles that you get people are trusting you to work to, to work with your instincts as much as you can? I think it's pretty rare. I haven't really been able to do that so much. I've always been, 
you know, worked with directors who have a very clear vision of what it is they want and they direct you specifically to be that character that they have in their mind. Um, I think on Terrence Malick's film Night of Cups, that was obviously like improv and free flow and, you know, totally just using your own essence and, and creating a character with Terry. But then in this one, um, it was... Can I ask you, what is yeah. Terry like? Terry. He's, uh, he is... A um, mythic figure that... Nerdy cinephiles like me, you know. Love. Have, yeah. He's am- amazing, like big hearted, so sweet, just really loves film, is just looking for real moments, constantly looking for authentic moments. Um, and he's just the most gentle, soft spoken person ever, hyper intellectual, so- knows everything there is to know about spirituality, um, and is just. A beautiful human being, and and I love that he just trusts his actors, and um, he gets really excited when you're doing something that he likes, and he says, keep doing that or do that again, come back out of the camera and run back in front of the camera and do it again. So him and Chivo have a great relationship. The cinematographer, the cinematographer, I should say, yeah, since yeah, he's yeah, yeah. won like every Oscar. <laughs> recently. Anytime he makes a movie, he really he he like gets wins the, the Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> It's ridiculous. But, yeah, they have a great camaraderie and um, a good working relationship. So it's just, yeah, it felt very organic. And that's still completely different than than the kind of instincts that need to go into something like this because this is the instincts behind written dialogue and, that's right. and the sort of scope and arc of a scene, whereas Terrence, it's like, do what you want. I wanna, I'm going to shoot it and then I'm going <laughs> to find it in the editing room. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very different experience. But... Um, I still felt that sense of liberation as a performer because Kate does hand you the reins and she says, just do what you need to do. And she can come in and tweak and change things and say, oh, I really loved this moment. Keep pushing in that direction. Um, but And she also is just very maternal and I felt held by her. And I think in this kind of film, you want to feel safe. Yeah. Um, talk about the difference between, you know, you've done horror before. You were in uh, Lights Out last year, which is a really fun horror movie. Uh, the difference between doing something like that and doing something like this. You're sort of like, I'm sure one of the reasons this script got to you was because someone knew that you could do horror or had seen you do horror before. But as we've said, there is the turn in this that makes it completely different. Yeah, this doesn't even really feel like a horror film to me at all. Um, I mean, it, there's thriller moments and elements to the film, but... Lights Out was very horror. I mean, it was playing on a ghost appears in the dark um, and, you know, she gets traumatised by a ghost. But there was also these rich characters in Lights Out. You know, I was playing a a woman whose mother suffers with manic depression and so there was actually a lot to do character-wise. And you don't always see that in horror films. It's usually just about, you know, these gimmicks, these big, um, you know, scary moments. But that's what I loved about Lights Out. And then this one, there aren't that many jumps I mean maybe as an audience member you jumped a few times but it's more psychological and it's just this mind game between the two of them and it's not black and white it's many many shades and he's not just the typical captor he actually has some humanity in him which is where this Stockholm syndrome idea comes from um there's a reason why she fell for him in the first place. And There's a deep need that he has. That's versus right. Versus just some sort of perversion or, that's or right. sexual hang-up, hang-up sort of a maybe a light, <laughs> a light, <laughs> light way, way of, of putting it. it. But he has, a, he has like a deep-seated misogyny and need that comes from that misogyny. Yeah, and she is like constantly struggling with um, his mind state and how she, it's very delicate the way she has to be with him. She's constantly walking on eggshells. But I love the scenes in which she takes her power back. I mean, it happens constantly and it ends up becoming this dance between them. And then I, I, you really see that she comes into her own and she really, you know, holds the space well. And I, um, I just fell in love with this whole process. Was this uh, a part that you had sort of been looking to find in the last few years? I mean, not this one specifically, but something like this that tested your chops and sort of put you out there in a different way? Definitely. You know, I've been a part of some great, like, big popcorn movies and um, I just wanted to continue to push myself as an actor. And I actually, the whole reason I have any sort of a career is because I started in this little film called 237, which is about youth suicide. And I played a woman who was pregnant um, with her brother's baby after being raped. And it was the most heavy 
subject matter you can imagine but I had to get beneath who it was this character was and it was so challenging as my first acting role but then it premiered at Cannes and American agents were there and then they're like let's point put break. you in yeah point break <laughs> and you know I'm number four and all these like cool fun movies but I wanted to go back to where I started I was like hang on I want to challenge myself as an actor um, and that's that's where I've landed. Back Love in the there. image of American agents seeing that movie. Well, like, we're we're going to make you a star. <laughs> she's really great as the victim of incest that's pregnant, but she's beautiful. So throw her in Point Break. I know. You know? So, 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 Jerry Bruckheimer film. It'll be perfect. <laughs> so it then was we'll nice. Go back. Then yeah. we'll go back to the fun stuff that you point. like to do. Yeah, I finally got there. The last few years, I'm finally back to where I started again. <laughs> How does it feel? It feels great. It feels like me. I feel passionate. About about my work. I love to be in films that have the potential to affect positive change in some way. And um, I just, I love, I love telling gritty, real, authentic stories. What was it like? I got to ask, what was it like going from that first film that premiered at Cannes where you played this character to these sort of big studio movies that you got to be a part of? I'm sure there was thrilling, oh but my I'm God. wondering. It was the most exciting thing ever. I remember one of my first big studio films was, um, bedtime stories and I got to start opposite Adam Sandler and I remember being like 21 and it was the biggest thing that had ever happened to me in my life like none of my friends that back home could believe it was happening they're like that's Billy Madison um and it was just like this incredibly exciting period um but I didn't have to do too much it wasn't that challenging um what is the what is the work day like there I mean you shoot I mean you bounce around and you have a wig on and you tell some funny jokes and it was just, um, uh, you know, it was enthralling. And by the way, so many kids love that movie, which is, I, I love it now being a mother. Um, my son has seen Bedtime Stories and he loves the movie. So it definitely, you know, it has its its beautiful place and it, it served its purpose. But I think as a performer, I, I, it was always just this void in me. I was, I was just waiting to fill it with that with that role, with that uh, chance to just go deeper. And finally, I'm in that place. I imagine that's such a weird feeling because you're in the midst of these massive studio movies. You're, you know, for lack of a better phrase, collecting a paycheck that is great for you and your family, but you still have this weird, er, like, <laughs> yeah. yearning to do something that means something to you. And I bet you talk to people about it and like, what the hell are you talking about? You're like, Yeah, well, I actually internalised a lot of that because... You know, I, I think I felt self-conscious saying to my friends, like, oh, I'm really craving something else. But um, because I, the truth of the matter is that I really loved doing them at the time and I, I so appreciate doing big studio films. They definitely have their place and I want to continue to do them. I just... Now it's exciting that I also get to do the other stuff because there was a period of time where I was never considered for any dramatic role in any independent because I was just kind of seen as the girl that does these bigger studio films. And, um, and the cool thing is when you find the balance of both, like for instance, Warm Bodies, it was such a great studio film and it had a big audience, but there were these great, incredible characters that we got to play. So... It's the best when you can have both, but that's very rare. And now you definitely shed a lot of the look that we, we've we seen you have before with Berlin Syndrome. Where did that come from? Outside of the moment where she's living in, in this space where there's no way for her to look, you know. But I think even as a traveler, as a tourist, you go into this looking a certain way, a different way than we're used to with you. Yeah, very stripped down. I didn't have a dot of makeup on my face. Um, if I got a pimple, the... <laughs> the director was so excited about it. She's like, let's shoot it. Um, so <laughs> she like loved all the flaws and the vulnerability because that's real. And I love and embrace real. I crave it when I watch films. I want to connect to something authentic. And so for me, um, I'm wearing makeup now because I'm doing a TV interview with you. <laughs> but I don't ever wear makeup in my everyday life. I never do. And so the way I got to look in this movie was really how my kids see me and how my friends see me. And there's something so liberating in that because it's just the way I look. And I do have really dark circles under my eyes. And I do look gaunt sometimes. And I, all those things were embraced and highlighted in here. And I loved it because I just got to be me.
Yeah. Well, you say uh, you love the real and you love films that draw you in with authenticity. Did you have any performances or movies that you watch sort of to inspire you for this performance? Um, well, I hadn't actually seen Room at the time, but since I've seen Room, I was like, oh, that would have been the perfect one to watch oh, because Brie's so phenomenal in that movie. Uh, but not really, not performances, but I did read a specific book um, it's called 3096 Days and it was written by Natasha Komposh who was actually um, abducted at the age of 10 and she writes about her experiences. She was in captivity, I believe, for eight years and she really gets into the emotions surrounding what it's like to be captive and the complex dynamic that she had with her captor and I found it the most helpful insight into the mind of someone who actually in real life went through this and um, I'm so grateful that I read that book before I went in and um, I have so much respect for her and her journey and her story and and it was also one of the reasons why I chose not to come in and out of the character so much because I wanted to live it and breathe it Um, and so it was really emotionally challenging after the six weeks it was I really felt like I went through something traumatic. So you stayed with the character throughout the entire day and... Yeah, and I I sometimes would try and wash her off of me and she was just there. It's like she just stuck on to me. Uh, It was really hard to separate the two and thank God I had my mum with me because she was holding down the fort with my 15-month-old at the time and I'd have to come and mask being happy mummy when really I was going through all these intense emotions to get this performance. So it was great and I loved the learning experience and there was a lot of growth in it. And thank um, God you had those few weeks on Hacksaw in between. I know, which is a little lighter. And, yeah. um, and then afterwards I took a year off because of doing both those films at the same time, it was really, I was just exhausted. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a year off. You've got kids to hang out with as Yeah, well. well, I took a year off, but I also got pregnant during that year and had a baby. So that's not really taking a year off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has questions at right here? Hi, Teresa. Thank, hey. thank, thank you for being here. So what, what are your uh, preparations for making the tense movies like Lights Out and uh, scary movies like that? Um, my prep, thank you for the question, it's, um, it's always different on each film but for this one I was reading the book and I, I liked having a lot of alone time and really getting into the idea of who she was and getting beneath her skin. It was really important for me to do that. With Lights Out, I didn't actually do a ton of prep. I am a true crime nut. I'm obsessed. I, I literally watch every documentary on true crime ever, listen to all the podcasts, the whole thing. So I already had a lot of stuff that I could draw on um, that I had listened to and I had seen. So it's easy to kind of tap into that world and, and use that for my roles. Next question. Hey, Teresa. Um, so for this movie, how much did you get to shoot outside in Germany and did you get to spend any time there, like in Germany, just like traveling? Yeah, I, well, I didn't really travel that much. Uh, we went to Berlin and I had a young baby at the time who's now three or a three major, I should say. Um, oh, so you shot the film two and a half years ago? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, not two, about two. two, about two years ago, yeah. So we stayed in and around Berlin and it was beautiful and I so fell in love with the city and I found the history fascinating and listening to local people's stories and east and west and just hearing the complexity of a city like that was enthralling and I became really, um, I kind of became obsessed with the city and we decided at the time, although we didn't follow through with it, we're like, let's buy a place here and we can Airbnb it out when we're not here and then we can travel to Berlin and just immerse ourselves in this culture. Uh, But, yeah, so I definitely fell in love with it. Uh, Next question. I think this is our last question. Hi. Uh, Besides working in independent films and uh, major studio movies like I Am Number 4 and Warm Bodies, uh, which are films I really do enjoy... Um, are there any thoughts of getting into franchises now since you've dealt with both? 
Yes, please. <laughs> that'd be great. Can you let someone at Marvel know? Because that'd be amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I would love that. I think that's any actor's dream. I also really am obsessed with um, action. I love doing action. I got to do a bunch in Warm Bodies and I'm number four. Uh, I did all my own stunts. So every day I would turn up to work so excited to do, you know, the physical portion of it. So I would love, love that opportunity to do that again. And, um, you know, the only franchise I've been a part of is probably uh, Lights Out because that's going to have a sequel, we believe. I think I'm going to be shooting that this year. But, yes, we can, we can try and get a superhero movie in there. That would be great. <laughs> You're going to turn Lights Out into a superhero movie? Yeah, I'm somehow going to turn that into a superhero movie. <laughs> I, feel, I, I feel like Point Break was probably a, a crack at a, a franchise at the time when, well, they, when they made it. Not really. I'm number four was. I mean, that was really the end of I'm number four. It's like, see you later. But then it never <laughs> happened. It was like, wink, wink. This isn't really the end. Um, but then sure enough, it was the end, unfortunately. <laughs> Same with Sorcerer's Apprentice. I signed on to three of those, signed on to three of I'm number four, but it oh, didn't no, happen. Really? Yeah. So with so with so with Point Break, you didn't sign on for more than one. No. But those other ones, wow, that's so interesting. So they make you sign on for three or four, yeah. no matter what. But yeah, you sign on to do the option. I think so. They can definitely say that you'd be a part of the uh, idea if they wanted to do. I, I think the second I'm number four was called The Power of Six, and my character was six. So that would have been this amazing. You know, I would have been doing fighting aliens and a lot of action, but it didn't happen. It didn't make enough money. I mean, ask you. Um, a dumb question because I because I should have done my research upstairs. But Sorcerer's Apprentice is the Nicholas Cage. Cage, one, right? yeah, Jerry Bruckheimer. Okay, so before I let you go, I have to ask you. Anybody I get on the stage, I ask them about working with Cage because yeah, he's the man. Yeah, hello, what was Teresa. it like working with Nicholas Cage? <laughs> it was great. It was um, he was one of the biggest movie stars that I had ever met at that time, and I remember being so. I was so intimidated by him. I was completely not myself. I was like this bumbling, nervous mess. And he's just, he's a really charming, lovely, kooky character. Um, and he is, and his voice, it's like, it's the best. Um, and he actually, we sort of kept in touch a little bit afterwards. And um, he was going to present me with an award, like this like breakthrough award for the Australians in film. Uh, foundation and he's just a, a really good human being does keeping in touch with Nicolas Cage like after working together entail like getting strange emails with random things that he's become interested in <laughs> like I imagine it's Castles. like Teresa check out these like leather boots I found they're yeah. amazing hey, they're Teresa. made from crocodiles or something like <laughs> you're actually pretty good at that <laughs> I love Nicolas Cage yeah like, I, if you put a Nicolas Cage movie on I will watch it you will watch back, it no matter forever. Which movie it is? Because yeah. there's some ones out there that are hard to watch. <laughs> yeah, no, he he is good. I yeah, it was just email like a couple of emails back and forth, like how you going, how's life, things like that. Not so weird, <laughs> pretty normal. <laughs> uh, Teresa, congratulations on the film. It's wonderful. It's an incredible performance. By you. it's in you. theaters right now, right? People it can is. check it out. Go see it and then tell your friends. <laughs> Berlin Syndrome, everybody. Teresa Palmer, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye.